Hi everyone, my name is Julie and today I want to ask you a question. Have you ever thought about what is language? Where does it come from? And why it is that on the whole earth we humans are the only ones to have it? Or are we? Today we're gonna explore the origins of language. If you don't believe that language was created by an intervention of a supernatural power, you will admit that the question of language origins is a complex one. It is so complex that in 1866, the Société Linguistique de Paris issued a ban on the subject, considering it unsolvable. Obviously, this is not the case anymore, and every year we see numerous papers trying to solve this tricky problem. Especially in the later years, the progress in contingent sciences allows us to base our hypothesis not on fantasies about what could have been, but on proven facts. Obviously, the question of language origins lies on the intersection of numerous different sciences neurology, genetics, archaeology, anthropology, sociology, linguistics, and many others. But it's suitable to start with linguistics, as before determining how the language appeared, it is necessary to understand what is language. We always assume that language is something unique to humans, but is it really? It is possible some animals also have complex communication systems, but we just don't understand them. Mr. Gabby, I'm sorry to distract you, I know you're very busy, but what can you tell me about the communicative system of cats? <laughs> For example, bees with their dance can tell how far and in which direction the food is. Ants have a complex communication with pheromones that we haven't even deciphered yet. Dolphins have their own names and they also have conversations. They listen to what the other has to say and answer back. Our closest relatives, primates, also have complex communication systems. For example, vervet monkeys have different alarm calls for different types of danger. The call for a leopard makes the group climb a tree. The call for an eagle makes them hide in bushes and the call for a snake makes them check the ground around their feet. Chimpanzees could have a very vast amount of such calls. For example, they can clearly differentiate between a call for apples and a call for jackfruits. The communicative systems of animals are studied, but of course too much is still unknown. As for human language, the most important criteria to describe it can be the fact that our language is endless. With a limited amount of sounds, we can express and understand an unlimited amount of situations. Actually, this also is true for sign languages, so it's more correct to talk about a limited amount of starting units, not sounds. So do animal languages have such a quality? Well, again, we don't know exactly yet, but it seems that animals can have a small or even a relatively large amount of signals that they could even combine to create new meanings. But the scale of it is dramatically less than human language's capacity. So maybe in the wild animals don't need something like a language. But you must have heard of those experiments where animals were taught human language and were able to communicate using it. For example, Washo the chimpanzee, Coco the gorilla, Chantek the orangutan were taught American Sign Language. A border collie chaser was able to learn more than 1000 toy names using lexigrams or visual symbols. A parrot Alex was even taught to speak and got to considerable heights. He could distinguish shapes, colors, materials, knew the meanings of concepts like same, different, I want, I'm sorry. He even created a new word Bannery, from banana and berry, to name apple, which he didn't encounter beforehand. Can you tell me what's different? Color. Alright. Can you tell me what's same? Shape. Good boy. What color bigger? You know, what color bigger? Good boy. Good birdie. Experiments show that great apes can understand concepts like more, yes and no, now and later, funny and scary. They distinguish people and other monkeys by names. They also can create new words. 
For example, Washoe, named a swan by a combination of symbols water and bird, and can use words in an abstract way. Saying Washoe has called a man named Jack, who wasn't giving her food, Dirty Jack. These experiments show how advanced animal cognition can be. But how advanced is their language? Even though animals show abilities of producing new words and meanings, still this ability is limited. The sentences they make are short, two, three words, and most importantly, the words in a sentence do not connect to each other in a correct, systematic way. In other words, their language doesn't have grammar. What the grammar is and how it is acquired by humans can be seen in studies on how language is learned by babies. As language appearance is something that we cannot physically observe, some researchers suggest that by studying how babies acquire language, we can understand how language was created, as supposedly it followed the same processes, only stretched in time for much, much longer. This hypothesis is inspired by the so-called biogenetic law, which suggests that the development of an embryo mimics the evolution of that species. From birth, a baby's brain can differentiate between his mother tongue, a foreign language, and a non-language. By three months, babies start to make sounds similar to vowels. By seven months, they try to pronounce something similar to syllables. Besides, in the beginning, these can be very diverse types of sounds, characteristic to all kinds of languages. But by 10 months, babies are only sensitive to the sounds of their mother tongue. At about 18 months, children experience a vocabulary explosion, a rapid acquisition of words. At around 3 years old, the grammar explosion happens, and children start to rapidly learn grammatical constructions. It is said that the apes that were taught language were using it at the level of 2.5-year-old child, so they did not reach the grammar explosion. There seems to be a sensitive period when children can absorb grammar, and if the language wasn't learned at that time, the window closes and that ability becomes forever lost. For example, a Mongli girl who was taught language at an adult age learned a lot of words, but wasn't able to use grammar. She made sentences like orange Tim car in, which means Tim is in the orange car. So what is grammar, this superpower that can only be obtained in childhood and once obtained is perfect forever without even thinking about it? According to Noam Chomsky, all people are born with universal grammar. It's like a genetically coded set of all possible grammatical rules from which, while growing up, some are selected, those corresponding to the mother tongue, while others are discarded. It's as if we were born with a switch that, at the age of three, turns to the needed language parameters. That would explain why children acquire grammar so quickly. But not everyone supports this theory. Another explanation could be that people are good at finding and understanding patterns in everything. It's not like animals don't understand them, but we are particularly wired at finding patterns in a communicative system. This ability of finding structure in chaos is even more striking when we study the evolution of pidgin languages. These are very simplified means of communication that develop when speakers of different languages have to somehow communicate in a restricted field of activity, say for trade. In pidgins, there are almost no rules of grammar, the speech is slow and simplistic, as the main goal is just to transfer the message. But when a pidgin becomes a native language for some people, it immediately obtains grammar, and this grammar can be completely different from the grammar of the languages that went into the original mix. For example, in Tokpisin, a creole between Papuan languages and English, a new rule appeared that any transitive verb had to get a suffix im, which itself comes from him. So we get look him for to see, drink him for to drink, etc. But in English, you wouldn't say look him or drink him. It's a rule that appeared independently thanks to our ability to find regularities, the ability that for sure should sit somewhere in our brain. I wish we all could learn languages so effortlessly in the adult age too. Sometimes language learning seems like an impossible task. 
For me, Japanese is a tough one. It's been eight years I'm trying to learn it, but I still can't speak it properly. You know how it goes. It's hard to find good tools for learning on your own, and especially it's hard to stay motivated. But I think I found a solution. Today's video sponsor is Busu, a language learning platform. It gives you lessons broken down by themes where you can practice reading, hearing, writing and speaking. What makes Busu different is the community. You can connect to native speakers and practice the language you're learning with them. The community will also correct your exercises. And it's much better to be corrected by a native speaker than an AI. We can all agree with that. Finally, I really like the study plan feature. So let's say I'm learning for fun. I want to reach B2, of course. I want to practice every day uh, in the evening here. And I want to study hmm, 20 minutes a day. I can do that. Oh, it says I'll reach my goal in February 2023. Suddenly, language learning is not that daunting anymore. I think it's a really nice app, so why not give it a try? Check out Busu with the links in the description. You can sign up and start learning for free and try out Busu Premium free trial for 7 days. Several parts of human body participate in articulation and deciphering of speech. First of all, comparing to apes, our voice box is positioned lower which puts us at risk of choking of talking while eating, but at the same time gives us possibility to pronounce sounds clearly, as the tongue has more space to move in both horizontal and vertical plane inside the mouth. Actually, babies are born with a higher voice box, just like monkeys, and only by the age of three it comes down, exactly when the language is acquired. We also need a good breathing control, and for that we have a diaphragm, which is our natural equalizer. Thanks to it, we pronounce different sounds, like for example A and L, with the same volume. And in the syllable LA or AL, the powerful A does not kill the consonant L. Intercostal muscles also participate in breathing. Those are activated by nerves, which go through a spinal cord, thus we need a relatively wide spinal canal to contain it. Finally, we don't only need to produce speech, but also to hear it. Our ears are wired differently than those of chimpanzees, for example. We hear the best sounds in between 2 and 4 kilohertz, which is exactly the frequency of spoken speech. Chimpanzees, on the other hand, distinguish the sounds around the frequency of 1 kilohertz, which is useful for hearing their long-distance calls. To control all of this, we need a sophisticated brain. There is no single area that is responsible for language. It is a complex action, so many areas are involved. The areas most associated with language, though, are the Broca's area and Wernicke's area. People with Broca's area damage have difficulty switching from word to word or even from sound to sound, and they almost don't use grammar. People with Wernicke's area disorder can use grammar, but they have a hard time recalling the correct word. So this area helps us connect a word to its meaning. In the latest years, the science of genetics has greatly advanced. Maybe scientists could identify a language gene? Well, as you might have guessed already, language involves multiple complicated processes. So several mutations in various genes had to happen to give us possibility to speak. Notably, there is the FOXP2 gene, the damage of which makes people have difficulties with grammar. Interestingly, when the human FOXP2 gene was inserted into mice, their task automation became faster, which proves that language acquisition has a lot to do with this ability. Since the last common ancestors between us and the apes, this gene had accumulated two mutations. These and other mutations were clearly the object of natural selection. But why was it important evolutionary for us to get language? And when, and most importantly, how did it happen? Having a big brain and a lower voice box that puts us at risk of choking while eating is quite costly so it should have provided a considerable advantage during evolution. The beginnings of language are tied to the beginnings of human evolution itself, when our ancestors started to live in the savanna, 
around 3-4 million years ago. Many factors facilitated language appearance. New environment, walking on two feet, usage of tools, hunting. All the same factors that made us evolve into humans. Actually, language wasn't the goal itself. It was developing as a result of the development of our brains and thinking in general. The most important thing about us and our ancestors is a complex social structure and low aggression. I know it sometimes doesn't seem like we have low aggression, but just compare our teeth to those of chimpanzees. We are teddy bears compared to them. Because of that, good communication was key. That is why we applied our growing brains to improve our communicative system. So we could say that language was developed as a byproduct of our evolution. And just a side note, this is one theory of many, but I don't have time to explore them all here. And in my opinion, this one makes the most sense. We accept that our species, Homo sapiens, that was fully formed already around 100,000 years ago, has always had language of the same complexity as we have today. But obviously, language didn't appear from nothing. Who were the first of our ancestors that started having something similar to language? The communication system of Australopithecus, who came out of the jungle, was probably not too different from that of chimpanzees. The spinal canal widening needed for breathing control probably started with Homo ergaster, who lived between 1.8 and 1.4 million years ago. So maybe this ancestor has already started to prioritize speech for signal exchange. Fast forward to Homo heidelbergensis, a name I can never pronounce who lived between 800 and 100,000 years ago and who already had a wide spinal canal and a big brain. Hidlobergensis was the last common ancestor between us and the Neanderthals. Then the two branches split, with sapiens developing in Africa and Neanderthals in Europe. The small lingual bone, which is primordial for speech articulation, apparently had the same structure in Hidlobergensis, Neanderthals and us which suggests that all three had language, in some form. A deeper research on the lingual bone of a Neanderthal shows that it was subject to the same pressure as the one of speaking humans, thus very possibly Neanderthals used language too. The ear structure in Heldebrigensis shows that they were wired to hear speech, even though there is a high disparity among different individuals. That could indicate that at that period the full language was evolving, and some of the Hildebrigensis had better language abilities than others. And finally, we, sapiens, are in possession of the most enlarged zones of abstract thinking and signal synthesis of all of our ancestors and relatives. So maybe we were the only ones to have ever used language in its full complexity as it is today. So how did it actually happen? How did language come to be? Here I'm just going to explain my favorite theory. There are, of course, so many, but I'll let you explore them by yourself. In the beginning of human evolution, our ancestors started to adapt to a new environment, savanna, which was much more unpredictable than a rainforest. It became crucial to share information about what was happening around. First, this share of information could have even been with gestures, rather than voice. However, eventually, our ancestors started using tools regularly, so giving information by vocal signals became a necessity. The first communication might not even have always been conscious. Possibly, a lot of it consisted of unconscious comments that we even still use today. When you hit your pinky toe and scream a violent curse in an empty room, who are you saying it to? The natural selection, then, should have prioritized those who produced the most clear signals and those who were able to decode them. With time, speech became the primary communication type and more and more words appeared. At some point, the speech of these ancient proto-humans may have resembled a pidgin language. Simplified vocabulary, no grammar. But we know what happens to pigeons. When they become native languages, they obtain their grammar. The same might have happened in the inception of language. 
When human's capacity of seeing patterns became sufficient, somebody, possibly a particularly talented baby Hidelbergensis, might have noticed structure in this chaotic ocean of words, giving birth to a protogrammer, which was quickly picked up by others. At that moment, the process was already unstoppable. That was my take on this complex problem. Of course, I just barely scratched the surface, and we're surely going to discover more and more in future, but I hope you found this little essay informative anyways. Don't forget to subscribe for more language videos, and a big thank you to my top tier patrons who vote on next language profile videos. And you can vote too! Thank you so much for watching, and see you in our next exploration.